My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. I'm your host. And today my guest is David Archer. David Archer is a anti-racist therapist in private practice in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, with a master's in applied science, couple and family therapy from McGill University, a master's in social work, also from McGill, and a BA uh, in specialization psychology from Concordia University. He is a registered social worker, psychotherapist, an internationally certified clinical addictions counselor, a licensed clinical social worker, an NLP master practitioner. Hopefully I said all that correctly. Uh, David, welcome. Thank you for joining me on my podcast. I really appreciate your time and hope you're doing well. Well, thank you, David. Um, I haven't uh, renewed that that international addictions certification in a while, uh -oh. but, uh, but it's okay. It's not a problem. I spent uh, about five years working as an addictions counselor in a in a native community of uh, of Ganawage. and so that was that was probably when I when I had that certification. But I feel that without that understanding of addictions it probably would have led me into a different uh, direction. So I do think that everything that you listed there, it is factual. Just uh, the timing is just uh, is a little different. But. Okay. Well, I think that's a, that would, alone is fascinating to me. So let's start with your experience and professional background. Mm -hmm. what, what originally motivated you or drove you to become a therapist and then focus in that specialization? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is that before I was a therapist, um, when I was younger, uh, I was always, it's because what happens is with race is the interesting thing is that uh, race is what's given to you. It's not what you believe about yourself. It's not, it's not something that you give to yourself. It's that uh, the outside looks at you and then dictates that you are black and therefore blackness uh, means this, means that. And so when I was younger, I was well aware of, of race. And also in my context, being in this, uh, this province, there was always this awareness of language that it was very, um, so I was, I was in a context where there was a thing called Oka crisis, where there was, um, uh, native land was being taken from native people. I was in a context where there was uh, a referendum, a decision about whether the province of Quebec would separate and form its own country outside of Canada. So there was always an understanding that who I was, how the world saw me, would impact my experience of it. And before I was a therapist, I was a, a software engineer for about 10 years. I was very interested in the idea that we'd be able to solve complex problems through ones and zeros. And as I uh, continued in computers, I realized I was more interested in how to be able to solve the complex problems of, of our everyday humanity. So that's what drove me into the direction of psychology. Uh, getting uh, the masters of social work drove me in the direction of anti-oppression, of understanding that uh, some of the racial disparities some of the gender disparities, um, some of the cultural disparities, that some of them were socially constructed, some of them were just due to political decisions that 
could, you know, there's some decisions that someone could take today and they could end poverty in your country and in mine at the same time. So I was very interested in the fact that there were explanations for the suffering. And then I did the master's in couple and family therapy and found out that, uh, that if we're able to change one aspect of a system, then we can change the other aspect of it as well. And I think as the culmination of all of that, that uh, kind of brought together the whole package uh, that you see before you. Um, I'm also a person who's very interested in the concept of mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, and the idea that although suffering is a part of our experience, that sometimes when we sit with our suffering, sometimes when we sit with what's uncomfortable, that we can gain wisdom, even from the trauma. And through that, then we can transmute that trauma into a resilience. And so that's my life's work at this time of, of uh, helping people to recognize uh, that everyone deserves a second chance. Let me ask you, my questions jump around a little bit because there's so many different um, aspects and different subjects I wanted to try to touch on and just learn more about as well. So for those listening and for you, please forgive me if I jump around a little bit out of order, but I'd like to backtrack a little bit and ask you from a layman's perspective, how is a therapist different um, than say a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a counselor? How does the social work aspect or approach differ from the others? Just you know, for those of us who don't, or, you know, don't know. Sure. So the thing is that my title is psychotherapist and uh, therapist is not a reserved term, but psychotherapist is a reserved term. There's a, a different set of like uh, academic and like educational requirements to be a psychotherapist in my province. And that differs between states and between provinces. But uh, generally speaking, that uh, I think that uh, technically, I think almost, uh, and again, your, your country may be different from mine, but I think almost anyone can call themselves a therapist uh, because there's massage therapists and massage. And so therapist itself is a very wide, like general term, you know, and there's all types of other therapists that are out there. Uh, psychotherapy is specifically that you're trying to use interventions with an individual that are going to have long lasting uh, changes, that it's regular. It's different from the regular day to day support that some people might do if they are social workers. Uh, the social worker sometimes is going to um, help a person to deal with maybe some requests that are on a day-to-day -day basis, or they may not be always as consistent in terms of needing to, um, well, let me change the way how I explain it, is that social work sometimes can help people get resources. Sometimes it can be uh, interventions that are psychotherapeutic, but the full focus of what I do is designed for that long lasting and, uh, and definitive change. But I also want to say that just because my title says this, it doesn't mean other people can't do it. I've met a lot of social workers who even in a few sessions are able to do excellent work. I've met a lot of coaches that have done phenomenal work. It's just that we have different academic, uh, requirements to get the title of social worker, marriage and family therapist, and psychotherapist, which is what I am. Okay. So in your, in your lane as a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. you, so if you, you would send someone somewhere else to go get medication, for example. Right. So I, I only do, um, like, um, I guess, like interventions that involve the, the like speaking experiential okay. stuff. But if they needed uh, extra support, there's some people who have like, um, uh, that have like a more robust, like a trauma history. And for those individuals, they speak to maybe a psychiatrist who would prescribe medication. Right. Okay. So what, what is EMDR? Because I know that's mentioned on your website. Mm -hmm. What's EMDR? Can you break that down for us and how that works in coordination sure. with 
the therapy that you do. And um, I do not get the desensitization. Mm -hmm. So if you could break that down, <laughs> that would be great. 100%. Let me explain it in this way. Is that um, it's kind of that uh, there's a source to every behavior. Uh, for everyone, we have different motivations. And there's some people where uh, their behaviors get in the way of their everyday functioning. So, for example, I'll use the, uh, the idea of the alcoholic. So what happens with an alcoholic is that typically they are suffering, so they self-medicate. So because they're going through pain, they take medicine. It's just that their medicine, unfortunately, causes liver damage and a host of other, like cirrhosis of the liver and other types of damage to their, to their system. But still, even though it does those terrible things, it may allow them to feel some feeling that's not those negative feelings. So addiction typically is when you're using a substance despite the negative consequences associated with it. So the addict is in a way like entrenched in this idea that they need this drug in order to feel connected to mm -hmm. social situations, in order to feel normal and functioning in our society. So what I have seen is that I've never met an, uh, a person with an addiction who didn't also have trauma. So the behavior might be to see the person drink, but the source of it, the source of where that pain came from might have been something that happened a long time ago. It might have been something that doesn't even relate to alcohol uh, on the surface level. But every one of my clients, whether they suffer from anxiety, depression, eating disorders, um, uh, substance abuse, um, OCD, a lot of what happens at the beginning is that there's this pathogenic memory association between one thing and another thing. So if we go to the example of the alcoholic, there's many times that I've met people where when they were young, something terrible could have happened to them. It could even be when they were an adult and they lost their job or there's something that took place that set off this domino effect and led them to the bottle to try to nurse their wounds, so to speak, to try to find a way of being able to heal from the pain. So EMDR is also very effective for what we call PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. So when we think of our veterans who go off to war, they come back home and they have certain responses that might have been adaptive in the battlefield, but are no longer adaptive in the present moment. So EMDR is designed to target the source of these maladaptive behaviors. And what we want, eye movement, so EM stands for eye movement, then there's desensitization and reprocessing. And it's a form of therapy. It's a form of psychotherapy. And so I can, I'll break that down in a bit, but I just want to say that EMDR is designed to target those initial injuries so that the person in the present moment is able to reprocess uh, the original memory and desensitize themselves to the triggers that cause them to have those detrimental behaviors. Hmm. Okay, so I have to ask, I mean, how is there a way to summarize how EMDR works? Because in my mind, I'm thinking about Clockwork Orange, where you're, you know, the, the scene in Clockwork Orange, where he has to watch you know, scenes that, you know, these horrific scenes. And eventually he comes whenever he thinks of violence, he becomes physically ill. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if, you, if you've never seen that movie, so he's a whore in, in the movie Clockwork Orange, the, the main character is, you know, a horrible, vicious thug. He rapes and pillages and does all kinds of horrible things. So when he's fi finally apprehended, part of his therapy is he's made to watch videos of, you know, all these horrible crimes he's committed, but eventually he becomes ill. Every time he thinks about raping someone, he gets physically ill. Um, he yes. thinks about violence. He feels like throwing up. It's an association, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I'm sure EMDR is not 
like that this is an exaggeration, you know, from a movie. But are there any similarities? I'm just trying to understand what EMDR <laughs> is, you know, from from yeah. layman perspective. When you talk about desensitization, how does that work? Is it because that was actually is a classic movie, actually? Yes. It had a great uh, cult following because that was a very, yes, I haven't thought about that movie in a while, but yeah, that's a really interesting movie. So yeah, it's very different. I'm a film buff, so, yeah. <laughs> it's so very different. So Once you see Clockwork uh, Orange, you never forget it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So like, um, the way how it works is that, um, so I write about this in my book, and the name of the book is Anti-Racist Psychotherapy, Confronting Systemic Racism and Healing Racial Trauma. So I explain about the, um, like the, the working mechanisms, the mechanisms of action behind EMDR therapy or other memory reconsolidation therapies. But um, the general idea is that, um, just like as, as David was saying, is that there's an association that is made like with, was it Alec? What was his name? I forget the name of the character. Oh, I can't remember the guy's yeah, I name. Completely I forget. remember the the actor is Malcolm McDowell who played him, but I can't remember the character's name in the movie. I mean, anybody who have you haven't seen the movie, go see it. Uh, it will traumatize you just like it did me. Yeah, that movie did not come <laughs> out now. That that movie was a uh, was, was a classic. But anyways, the thing is, um, so what happens sometimes is that. Uh, in a similar way is that certain types of things happen to people and then there's an association that's made. So like, for example, the person who has been through difficulties when they're young, um, it's like they learn a lesson from going through these difficulties. They learn that the world is not safe or they'll learn that other people don't like them or they are undeserving of love. And so then anytime they see something that resembles or activates this, it could be a breakup with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It could be um, losing a job or a not get not being hired. That will activate that original belief that was encoded in the person's memory structure from that first initial injury, that first psychological pain that they experienced when they were younger. And it's like as if the brain... Uh, kind of, it keeps it in that form. So when you see some people who have an anger management issue, and even if they're in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, the anger management issue often looks like a temper tantrum that you'd see a two-year-old have, or a three-year-old, or a four-year-old. And it's almost as if they're activating um, the the behaviors and the beliefs at that time, feeling as if they are that small and feeling as if they are that powerless. So what we need to do then is, uh, so it can involve eye movement, uh, but it needs to involve bilateral stimulation of the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And so you can do this with eyes. I do it with uh, getting people to tap uh, from left to right on different parts of their body. Mm. And the general thing is that we want to build up a new association of helping them to know that even if you have one foot in the present by doing this bilateral stimulation, and then you have another foot in the past by thinking about the suffering, that eventually the body reorients itself to the present, that it's able to look at this terrible thing in the past and is able to know in the present that they are safe, that they are no longer the two-year-old, they are no longer in that three-year-old position, and it reorients themselves. This is why... Uh, the idea of mindfulness is very mm. important when we're talking about EMDR and mindfulness. What that is, is just, it's a way of being that involves a person orienting themselves to the present of being mindful of noticing what it feels like to be in their body. I also want to say too, is that um, when we do talk about uh, anti-racist psychotherapy, so I look at it in terms of the individual who's affected by racism. And this can be a black person. It can also be a white person. In fact, I believe that many of our countries, the way how they are formed, if I'm talking of the United States and also Canada, is that the origin of our country, so it was completely traumatic. Mm -hmm. It was that there were white people who left a country. They didn't, they didn't know what was gonna happen here. And when they met the native people, they felt, that they had to think of a plan, 
that did involve the genocide of these individuals. They significantly reduced the number of people who were here. And also to say is that when we think of the origin of our countries, when we, um, like this original violence that took place, that this itself is trauma. But we today, we dissociate ourselves from the trauma of, our, of the origin of our countries because it's, uh, it's inconvenient mm. to think about uh, the fact that, that there was a lot of bloodshed for us to be here, that there were a lot of people who should have been here with us whose descendants never made it. So what we do is we dissociate. We separate ourselves from the origin of our country and we go on with our behaviors. But every once in a while, there's something that triggers each of us and we see flashbacks from the original sin of the removal and the, the, uh, the genocide of Native people. We see these, these reminders in our society, but oftentimes we keep them suppressed. So much in the same way as I'll say that many of, our, of my clients may suffer from these traumatic experiences, I believe that our society as well is one that has been through many traumas and is still waiting to heal from them. How long have you been in practice in Canada? That uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how did you come to get, I wanted to get into your experience working with the indigenous groups in Canada, what made you go in that direction? What did you do with these, with the indigenous peoples there specifically? And how did that inform your perspective? Mm -hmm. Yes, because um, I remember like, like, because uh, the thing is that, like learning about the origins of why there's poverty in the world, of just knowing of like being like, why is it that the people that are rich, they have a certain complexion and the people who are poor have a different one. And of course, knowing that there's white people who are poor as well, but sometimes our society will just interpret them as collateral damage and they kind of get erased from any conversation. You often, t there's almost never a discussion about, there's, there's not a lot of discussions about poverty and how there's a lot of white people who suffer from it, but uh, but the thing is that there's a higher proportion of people who are poor who happen to be of native uh, uh, descent, native ancestry. There's a higher proportion of people who are black who can't afford basic needs, such as even affording like um, uh, uh, women's uh, sanitary products and you know tampons and all that. So we don't talk about poverty because it's too it's too inconvenient for us to discuss, but it is very relevant. So. So I was learning about these things of learning what what privileges we all have that we don't have to go through certain forms of suffering. And then I gained the opportunity to be able to work. Um, I thought I was going to be doing regular, so-called regular counseling. And then I ended up being an addictions counselor. And I realized that a lot of the focus with addictions counseling, in many cases, not in all, maybe it's changed since I've been there, but... Uh, a lot of times internationally and not just in that community is that there'd be this concern with the behavior. But I noticed that when I was working with a person who was a native individual and I was trying to treat the addiction is that it was impossible for me to be able to treat the addiction without talking about how alcohol got into their community. Mm. It was impossible for me to talk about uh, addiction without talking about the trauma that led them to take it. It was impossible for me to talk about, you know, putting down the bottle without talking about what was the ongoing stresses that they felt being in the native community, that they felt um, like feeling as if uh, that their native, the land they used to have was much larger than it actually was. Well, it was so, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's really to say that it's, uh, I owe it to my clients. It's my clients who taught me more than any book. Um, the, the people that I've seen who have recovered from their trauma, they've taught me more than any prof professor. I often say that is that not all of our teachers are going to carry fancy titles and ties to work. Sometimes it's going to be just a regular person that you see. But for me, it's especially to see people uh, who thrive despite the suffering that they've been through, who've been able to transmute their suffering into wisdom. It's one of the most beautiful things for me. 
it's the thing that keeps that keeps me going. And as you can tell, David, is that uh, uh, I have a roundabout way of explaining these things. I hope that answered that question. I think so. When you talk about anti-racist therapy, mm -hmm. is is it something that's applicable? Do you feel to other? psychotherapists and, and, and others in your, your field? Or is it something that requires in depth training and orientation? Mm -hmm. Is is there? A, how easy is it for other psychotherapists to get up to speed so that they can provide that level of uh, counseling? Oh, or therapy? I'd say that it's very challenging. Actually, I'd say that it's, um, it's something that I that I'm challenged by. Uh, anti-racist psychotherapy requires mindfulness and it also requires you to look in the mirror. This is something that's very challenging for every therapist because what happens is that as a, as a therapist is that we are trained to recognize suffering in others, but we're not always trained to recognize suffering in ourselves. So that's why I say anti-racist psychotherapy is not for the, for the faint of heart. Um, of course there's forms. I don't like, I'm not going to say I have the, anti-racist psychotherapy. I'm sure there's a hundred, if not thousands of other approaches that, that resemble this, but it's really to say that, um, everyone is able to do a little bit of, uh, of what's in the book. Not every, you don't need to be an EMDR therapist. You don't need to, to get EMDR therapy to, uh, to do anti-racist psychotherapy. It just requires like a little bit of looking outside of the box, a little bit of like having a commitment towards caring for yourself to care for others, and as well as an understanding that there's certain things that we take for granted that don't really make any sense. Like, for example, like um, the idea of the word Caucasian. So, mm -hmm. so the thing is that um, I've never met uh, a Caucasian person who came from Caucasia. In fact, where is Caucasia? Nobody knows. Well, actually, uh, the term Caucasian is from the Caucasus mountain region, which is, uh, it's a little, it's kind of close to Europe. But uh, the person who invented the term uh, Caucasian, uh, he had a, his name was Blumenbach. And he had this idea that, uh, that the most beautiful people in the world came from the Caucasus mountain region. So then he decided that that must be where the Garden of Eden is. Therefore, all people who are white, uh, are now Caucasian and everything else, every other race of individuals is a morally and physically degenerate form of God's original people. And we know this is, this is a fairy tale. This is something, it's not based on science, but it was interpreted as science, which is another term for another time, but it was scientific racism. And this individual was a race theorist and he's not, he's not the only one. Who, no. uh, who, uh, who did that. But it's just to say that even the term Caucasian, it's always referring to racial hierarchy. So that's why we know when we say that systemic racism is like, um, is in our society, we mean it in that way, is that we don't even know that the term Caucasian doesn't even make sense. European American makes a lot more sense. Because uh, African American, these terms make a lot more sense. But Caucasian, if you look into it, the etymology of how it came to be, it's only for writ to say who's greater than others. It's not for any other purpose, but you will still find it in scientific documents because we've upgraded our technology, but we have not upgraded our society yet. We can, it takes a little bit of awareness, take some courage, but you see, me, even me saying that might make some people feel a little uh, uncomfortable, but it's just to know that this is um, medicine doesn't always taste good, but it's good for you. Yeah. From a historical perspective, and tell me if this is an unfair question, how did racism in its different forms come to spread about the globe? Was it because of the, the dawning of the transatlantic slave trade? Did it have to do with, um, you know, some religious movement mm -hmm. or was it a combination of these factors? Because historically there was some type of edict, I think a long time ago from somebody, I don't know who said basically, you know, these people are the chosen ones. These people are the best. Go get mm -hmm. rid of anybody who isn't. 
And I think that was before the Crusades or something, but obviously I'm not a historian. So I'm hoping you can kind of point me in the right direction. Yeah, and me too. I'm also learning it as well because I'm, I'm also not a historian, but I'm also trying to understand it. Um, there is a book that spoke about, oh, I don't recall the author, but there was someone who, who actually has a book published talking about the origins of, uh, of this racial hierarchy. And apparently it did start even in like uh, ancient Greece, that there were some ideas of, of race being mm. greater than another. And I could kind of explain it in this way, is that, uh, so I spoke about Caucasian. Let me speak about another word. So there's a word that's called a uh, denigrate. And yes. we all know this word. When we're denigrating someone, we're disrespecting them, making them a bad way or looking at them in a bad way. But the term denigrate from Latin, it means uh, to blacken, to make something black. Okay. That's what, yeah. that's what these words mean. So this is in, it's in our everyday language that like, um, cause I, I remember people used to tell me, well, why do you make everything about race all the time? And, uh, it's actually not me. <laughs> you know, the thing is I didn't, I didn't start this stuff. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, trying to live my life and, uh, and appreciate life and trying to love and feel compassion. But it's this stuff that keeps getting at us. But yeah, so. It's, it's to say that um, I do think that a lot of the, the, the origins of, and this is just from conjecture, the rest is in my book, I explain most of this, but it's really to say that the, uh, the driving force for maintaining racism is for certain people to benefit and certain people to, to lose out on those benefits. Um, there's no other reason. It's just really like racism is kind of friends with, uh, with the economic system of capitalism. And it's also friends with the economic or the uh, the uh, the ideology of colonialism, is that you can't necessarily. And I'll explain it in this way: it's like in order for people to have benefited from the so-called new world, they had to first make it so that they were the original people of America. They had to, uh, as much as possible. They had to eliminate all of the native people. They did this in Canada as well. Mm. Is that, uh, I think it was one of our prime ministers who said something like they wanted to remove every mention of the Indian question, or maybe not the prime minister, but another governmental um, uh, official. And so you, need, so you need colonialism. You need to make it so that you completely erase the people who are there first, and you need to rightfully, or find a way to rightfully inherit the land. And when you have the land, mm. you need people to work on it. So you need to have slave ability. You need to make it so that there is a worker class who is going to then be responsible for doing the work. And also, uh, capitalism loves uh, cheap labor. Sure. So the thing is, I'd make sure not to pay these guys because they got a lot of work to do and we need to make it so the society functions in this way. So racism can only exist if there's people who benefit from it. And it oftentimes is going to be an economic advantage for certain individuals. And it's, and it's also a psychological advantage of meaning that if these people have it bad, then we have it good, except it doesn't work out that way. So white people end up suffering because racism, <laughs> racism doesn't work. It's, it's like, of course, it, there, there are like advantages being white, but there's a lot of, uh, like I speak, there was another person who said this, so uh, I don't want to take it as mine. But if we look at a ladder, and if we think that there's a ladder that represents privileges in the world, and if we think that black people are on the bottom of the ladder and then white people are at the top, uh, the interesting thing is that being a white man, even though white men are supposedly at the top of the ladder, um, uh, they don't feel that way. <laughs> being a white man doesn't mean that all your problems are gone. And, you know, like, and so this idea of saying that people are greater than others, it, it's uh, because of their skin complexion, because of, because of how they look, if you see them with a light on, like all of this is, it's illogical. It's, it's not, it's not scientific. It's, uh, it's just another trauma response. It's a Rhythmic fear of that. Game. Yeah. It's, a, it's really a fear that there's not enough to go around. So yeah. that's why we need to hurt other people. That's why we need to, uh, to harm them. 
And this is just another trauma response. That's how I interpret it. And you had, um, I think it was manifest destiny in the U.S. was the term that they called it when they began mm -hmm. expanding outward mm -hmm. into the U.S. with the idea being we only have so much resources, we only have so much physical space here, so go out there and get it while you can. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I saw the very, very powerful uh, docu-series on HBO Max, I think it's called Eradicate All the Brutes. Yes, Exterminate and All the Brutes. Exterminate, yeah. thank you. Very, very, very difficult to watch, um, but extremely informative. Um, very, yes, very, very well. Peck, right? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, very yes. well done. That's something I've got, I've got to check that out. If you haven't seen it, uh, no, it, it, it was... It, it was extremely powerful, very, very difficult to get through, but I thought it was very, very well done. And, and I was really surprised actually that it was there to watch. Um, let me ask you just in your day to day practice. I mean, do you see a need for anti-racist psychotherapy going back to childhood? Because I, I've noticed if you look at the drawings of little children, like pre-K, maybe the first three grades or so, if you look at their drawings and you compare the drawings, I've seen this where you compare the drawings of African-American children to the white children. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, I'm not saying all cases, but in some cases you see the drawings are quite different where you see the little African-American children, what they draw, how they see themselves in their drawings in proportion to their environment in the pictures is very different than the other children. And it really made me think, you know, wow, is that how you really see yourself? I get that you're a child and, you know, you're drawing a stick figure, but the stick figure is this big and the house is way up here. Then I look at Johnny's uh, 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 drawing and he's bigger than the house. Mm -hmm. Have you seen things like that? Do you think no, what you... I've, not, I've never seen that before. But what I can say, though, is that... Um because I haven't seen the research on that. My specialization is not for, for young children. But, um, but what I will say, though, is that uh, in that situation, who's the teacher? <laughs> That's the question I have to ask. What is it that the teacher is doing that makes it so that the, um, the, the young child is going to perceive themselves in that way? Because what, what happens... Well, uh, I mean, even the kindergartner teacher or yeah. the grade one teacher, like who, what is it that they're saying that makes it so that certain people, mm -hmm. because the thing is that um, I never believed or thought that I could become a psychotherapist because I never saw anyone who looked like me who does this. And what happens is that there's not a lot, like there's a disproportionate amount of, uh, there's not a lot of black teachers. No, there used to be very I think few. like around uh, apparently like before segregation, there was a lot more black teachers, but uh, it's, it's just to say that we have to ask the question. Um, and, and again, we don't have to blame the victim and say that, why is it that black people see themselves in this way? For us, we, the, the, the question that I'm interested in is who teaches them this and is the teacher aware of this disparity? Why is it that the teacher continues, if, if this is in the research, because I haven't seen the research for it, but why is it that the teachers continue to replicate this uh, in their studies? Is there any corrective measure that is done for the black students to be able to see themselves as equal to the, to the, uh, to the non-black students? These are the questions. This is what I mean about like, um, if we're gonna treat an addiction, we can, tell the person to stop drinking. Okay. We can tell them, like, we can say, why is it that they're drinking? They should not be drinking. And we can also address the trauma that f causes them to drink in the first place. So that is what I mean about how there's a way of being able to target the sources 
of these things. And if we can target the source, the behavior will regulate itself. It'll, it, it won't happen anymore. Hmm. Okay. Let me ask you your opinion. What needs to be done to address or mediate racism within um, African-American, African-Canadian communities and other mm -hmm. historically marginalized groups where you have discrimination on the basis of, you know, not even skin color so much as gradations or, or, or shading? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the same exact answer is that when we look and we see why is it that black people are in this way, we have to look what's in the environment. And we have to think, how do we eradicate poverty? Like these, these are the better questions for me. I believe that like, um, if we're seeing that a specific group is suffering, we got to think, like if every like, for example, I'm gonna mess up this metaphor. But for example, if there's a village, and everyone is getting sick whenever they drink the water. We shouldn't be asking the individuals of like, well, hey, why do you keep getting sick? Well, we can, we can ask the individuals and they'll probably tell us. But what is the common thread? If we're saying that historically there's this issue of colorism, when did it start? And if we look back, we will see that uh, enslavers, white people, what they would do is they would have sex with children because they'd have sex with young girls against their will. It was sexual assault. But remember, black people were considered as poverty. So our history does not talk about it as if it's sexual assault because it's product. You know, it's, it's capitalism. You got to get money. So it's not seen as if it is actually um, uh, sexual assault. And also is that when they would have sex with these young girls, then depending on the complexion, then they would be the ones to control who gets what privileges and who doesn't get what privileges. Okay. So this is what I mean. We have to look back at the history and when did it start? Who initiated these things? And I think, but to answer your question, the way to resolve it is for white people to heal from their, from their trauma. And their trauma help me understand what is their trauma i mean i've heard yes. the term white fragility i've heard the term white rage i've heard the term uh white mm. flight but so i don't I'm... understand how that really manifests itself what is what are they yes. upset about so the thing is that um i don't know if it's upset i think it's more hurt is that um it's like I think that if we think of uh, the fact that in Hollywood, for example, we can name maybe like a hundred, like white, like uh, like famous people, and uh, we can probably name I don't know I don't watch any of that stuff, but you could probably name a whole bunch of black people as well. What's interesting is that if you go around the world, they can also name those same hundred white uh, actors. It's very strange. It's very strange when you ask like Japanese people and they know, they know our actors. Like it's very, it's very strange. Okay. Cause we don't know their actors. We don't know, you know, like you could ask people in India, you know, they got Bollywood. We don't know. We don't, we don't know Bollywood. Right. Okay? So, so what, uh, what I'm saying is that, um, there, we don't talk a lot about the trauma that white people have been harmed by because it doesn't play into the idea that white people must win at all costs all the time. So I think, because there's some studies by Rachel Yehuda, she's a person who did some uh, great research on the effects of multi-generational transmission uh, at the epigenetic level for survivors of the Holocaust. Mm. So we don't know how many generations this thing passes down, okay? But remember that there were the witch hunts in Europe and the United States. Okay. That was traumatic. Like, like if we just think about that, is that at any time someone could just come up to you and be like, you're a witch, you die now. All of a sudden mm -hmm. we, we don't, we don't really think about these, these terrible things of like the, um, the plagues that hit the black plague in Europe, how many people it, it completely devastated Europe. 
like, do, do we know if, if white people have recovered from the trauma of these things? We don't, we, we really don't. And how many generations does this thing pass down? We haven't had, su we haven't had the ability to measure epigenetics and to measure these like genetic changes for long enough for us to even understand if these initial traumas, if even like being in the, the harsh environments, the harsh winters of Europe, of the food insecurity, apparently there was like, um, cause of course, you know, that there were European tribes in Europe and it was especially when they stopped being nomadic and when they became sedentary, that the scarcity mentality began and a lot more violence started when, when white people, they weren't even considered white back then, but when white people felt as if there was less to go around when they were nomadic, like many nomadic cultures, you go where the, where the food is, you go where the, you know, you, you can, you can always have that diet, that dynamic aspect, but, yeah. but that's what I mean is that the original, we don't even, we really don't even talk about the original trauma that, that white people experience. And so the, and it's intentional. It's because black people must be the ones who are suffering in our society. We, we cannot, we can't really open up that bag because um, it's, it goes against our understanding of how to solve this problem. Let me ask you this. Um, how should we discuss racism amongst people who deny that it even exists mm -hmm. in modern society? I don't know about what's, you know, politically what's going on in, in most other countries. I try to follow it to the, you know, to the extent that I can, but there was a U.S. politician who said recently, very, very recently, look, racism doesn't exist in the U.S. because we had President Obama. Now right. we we're, now we have a uh, vice president, Kamala Harris. Yeah. So racism is done. It's over. Right. But yeah. there are people who legitimately. I don't know if he believes this seriously or if he's just saying <laughs> it to appease okay. his base group of, of voters, but. When you encounter people like that who say these things, I mean, what do you what do you say to that? Other than you could back off and just say, you know what, I'm not going to engage you because you're you you could be mentally unstable or something that you don't see the obvious. What's the proper way to 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 discuss it in that in that kind of context? Mm, it's a good question. Uh, one thing is I kind of throw the book at them. <laughs> I mean, literally, your book. Take out your book and literally <laughs> throw it at them and hope that the binding is really heavy, right? Yeah, they could get the hardcover. There's a the hardcover, there's the audiobook, paperback. But no, nah, what seriously is that, uh, uh, you know, the challenging thing is that I don't feel it's my responsibility to convince anyone of racism. I I don't. <laughs> For me, is that... Um, there's so much, there's so much evidence that's out there. And even the example I gave before about Hollywood is the fact is like, that's a pretty, it's a pretty simple example is that we don't know anything about, uh, about Nollywood. We probably, many people have never even heard of Nollywood, yeah. but, but, but it's really to say that, um, um, I think that it's really the best people to confront racists is white people because uh, racism is a white person's problem that just ends up affecting black people. But if white people are able to say, look, we're done with this. If white people say, you know what? We want a more equitable society and we will do everything in our power to make it so, then it'll happen. Um, the, the politician, like the, <laughs> is because the thing is, as a Canadian, we, you guys is, uh, your your politics is much more exciting than ours, so we so we know you guys as politicians. I think it was I think it was Lindsey Graham, but I don't know for sure. Um, yes, you know, yes, I yes. think it was him. But the 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 feeling is when you hear this that from a visceral perspective, yes, you want to try to find some way to say stop spreading disinformation because you're legitimately causing harm. You, if you want to believe that, that's your, your, your option. 
But when you as a, as a public figure and lawmaker, you get out there and say these things, whether you believe it's true or not, you're doing actual harm because the people who vote for you, the racists who hear this rhetoric yes. get excited. They're going to, yes, this is great. We're going to vote for him. Uh, yeah. He's he's our guy. And I, I'm sure that's why he says it and others like that's him say this. Yeah. But from a visceral perspective, you want to step in and say, stop spreading information that is just factually incorrect. There's no way that it could have any basis in reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. Um, for me, I could ask, well, well, David, what do you think? What do you think is the best way of being able to adjust? Now, that's therapy. Um, <laughs> from me personally, it's to say I have other things to do. For me personally, I have books to read. I've got dishes I have to do, and doing the dishes are more interesting than than trying to disprove an obvious truth. Mm -hmm. So that, for me personally, that's how I deal with it. That's how I take it. But intellectually, I know that it's doing a profound disservice to others when I hear this. Yes. So again, is that um. I think that there will always be people that will uh, believe in alternative facts, as I think they called it in a specific news cycle. I think lies are more direct, but dis, you know, disinformation is okay too. I mean, if you know something, if you know something is wrong or factually incorrect, but you say it anyway, it's a lie. Yeah, but again, is that um, I think that. Um, I think that, like, the thing is that we can't be tolerant of everything. And I don't mean to sound like authoritarian, but it's just uh, we can't necessarily be tolerant of, uh, of pain and suffering and people who want pain and suffering to continue for others. And I think that in our society, we are. So I think that what needs to happen is that we start to be a bit more tolerant of, of like, resolving pain and suffering. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think... Um, I think that like, like even when I think about it, is that uh, I'm talking about trauma, but realistically, um, we should be talking about resilience because I think everybody already knows that the world is a little unfair. There's some, some things about the world that are just, uh, that just benefit certain people more than others. And when the person will tell me that there's no racism, I'll ask them, is there sexism? And most mm -hmm. times people will tell me yes there is um i've spoken to a white woman that would tell me they don't see race and i'd say well i don't see gender in fact you can't be a woman because i'm not a woman and they'd they'd say well that's that doesn't make any sense i say well well yeah of course of course not <laughs> of course none of that stuff makes sense because the thing is we all see gender or at least our interpretation of gender and we all see race or at least our interpretation of race but the goal is not to make it so that we put blinders up. The goal is to make it so that we can see the differences and still choose the, uh, the moral high ground of saying that everyone is deserving of love and like, uh, and like, you know, sustenance, caring and compassion. So, I mean, of course there's people who have a problem with what I say and that's, that's pretty much, that's fine. But I do think, uh that we just need more voices like yours david if if the thing is that we just need it to be that it's not an echo chamber so if you're going to use your platform and host uh you know strange psychotherapists from a different country like me on your on your thing which i do appreciate but if you're going to do that that's that's part of it as long as we have like an alternate you know as long as we have options of what we can listen to as long as it's not just one narrative because there there will be racist people for a long time. But the term anti-racism, I think, is new for a lot of people, despite the fact it's been around since the beginning of our countries. <laughs> yeah. Since it began, you had people against it and speaking against it, I would definitely hope. Yeah. Let me switch gears a little bit. Um, okay. Here's a hypothetical scenario. Well, a little bit hypothetical. Fantastic. You got some good questions, David. Let's go. Let's, I hope what do we so. got now? A little bit hypothetical. 
I'll Let's leave go. it at that. I have a female friend who's African American. She yes. has experienced racial trauma, some of which the incidents are related to white people in public life, asking, hey, how much do you charge to do laundry? Uh, what floor do you work on, you know, while in a, a condo uh, condominium, assuming she's a housekeeper when she isn't, mm -hmm. she is a resident where she was asked this and it's yeah. caused her anger and frustration. Yeah, um, she's highly educated, but no matter what she does, some people will always see her as subservient to them right. due to the melanin content of her skin how would you counsel her to begin helping her heal and then secondly to that what could she do independently of direct engagement with you she may not be able to afford you for example mm -hmm. or may not have internet or whatever to facilitate greater healing yeah so i think the the best thing that we can do is we need to change the whole structure of our system we need to make it so that we eradicate poverty that's that's the basic thing. Uh, what poverty does is it creates adversities for individuals. And what adversities do are they increase the chances of going through trauma. And I, I do think that psychotherapy is helpful, but I don't think that everybody needs psychotherapy. I think that if we just make it so that, uh, like, all of a sudden, that everyone can afford to eat, uh, that all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about your light bills. Um, it's going to reduce that scarcity mentality in our society. And uh, these instances of what you're talking about, these microaggressions, uh, many times these are by white people because there is a social script that says that it's only white people that must uh, be in positions of power and that that must, uh, that must have certain mm. influence. So those people who do those microaggressions whether at a conscious or unconscious level, because I've met both types of white people. Um, it's just to know that they're trying to play out a script. So what we need to do is redefine our whole society. I have and, to interject. Um, yeah. I ha I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have to interject because I remember seeing something online from Donald mm -hmm. Trump, and I remember reading it, and he said something, and I thought, that may be the only thing that you've ever said that's actually true. And he was saying something on Twitter where someone said, because we had eight years of Obama, there was this backlash and anger. And a lot of those people were inspired to go vote for him because of his rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing it and I thought, if you've ever said anything factually correct or even moderately intelligent, this is probably the one time. So I didn't, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you yeah, said that, why you, brought up, why you brought up this man's name. In this but when you said that, it made me, <laughs> it made me think of that because how, when you, when I think racism and I think all of these things, that's what I think yeah. of. Yeah, But you know, the thing is, I got to say, too, is that Trump is not like the he's not like the racist president. The most racist presidents were the ones who owned like enslaved people and the ones who owned enslaved people and also said that um, that we shouldn't dismantle slavery. Right. Those are the most racist of, of your presidents in your country. Um, but but what, what I'm saying is that um, uh, since you brought up the idea of Trump, it's it's really to say that it racism didn't start with him and it's if we start to think outside of the box and if we start to ask these types of questions uh then we can we can get some better answers but um the the reason why because you asked the question about this individual hypothetical person yes i tried to answer at a higher level so if we try to aim at higher levels, instead of at the individual level, if this thing has been replicating itself multiple times, then it means that there's a common source. What is the drinking water that everyone is consuming that makes these individuals sick? And we will know that it is uh, the pillars of white supremacy. And it's not that, uh, that white people themselves are the bad thing, it's that the conception of whiteness, of saying white means perfect,
black means terrible, which is what I call the binary complex trauma cycle, which is just to say that white supremacy in a way validates black suffering and uh, black suffering then validates white supremacy. It's really just to say that if we change one part of the system, we will inadvertently change the other, but we got to think a level above the individual. Mm. So we got to do it in two ways, solving it at the level of social policy and also being able to help the individuals to heal. It doesn't need to be just a psychotherapist. I mean, I'm, I'm only one man and my waiting list is full. So there's no way that I could like help everybody in the world, but we need to know that people can heal from trauma. People are doing it every single day, but we also need to understand that we cannot be defined by our trauma, that these terrible things, they did take place and they have been painful but everyone deserves a second chance. There was no disposable person in, in this world. And the only way how we free ourselves is if we're all free together. So from an individualistic perspective to help this friend, what would be like a first step to just for that individual person who, you know, is just, tired of being hurt of you know being asked you know uh, hey can you do my laundry uh, you know meanwhile this is a person you know working a, a professional position you know what could you do on an individual basis because obviously you you know you can working on society is at the higher level how do we help yes. how, how what could you do to kind of kickstart kickstart maybe not a good verb but to aid you know in helping this person begin healing mm -hmm. yeah i'm going to tell you the same thing because i've heard this story multiple times is that we need to to think about how do we end the uh the source of the suffering because we can keep telling women that if we want less sexual assault that they should change how they dress we can do that but i do not believe in those types of interventions I think that a part of it is about being able to equip women with the skill set and with the skills to defend themselves when necessary. But a part of it is also to get the oppressor off their back. And that's, that's the only, that's the only way, but, but if it is a hypothetical situation, um, I think that it's important for like, what I try to do is I try to help individuals to, uh, to kind of think about, uh, it's kind of where they're, where they're putting their eggs into whose basket. And if they're working and if they're in a work environment that is uh, taking away from them, uh, we have to eventually help people to, to know that, that, uh, that we can build our own, we can build our own institutions. And I also think that like, um, like for this, this hypothetical individual that they may have believed that they do need to put up with these types of things, but there's, but, uh, there's a way of being able to heal from it, but there's also like, um, a responsibility she has about thinking about, is that the place that she, that she needs to keep working at? But what's interesting is that now we have recourses when people are doing these terrible things, you can go a level above them, go to HR, you know, you can do all of that stuff. But I'm going to tell you is that again, helping this individual, there's suggestions we can give. But that won't stop the next time that it happens. So we have to let the person know that their worth is not defined by some random white person or some random individual that's that's out there. Um, their worth is not dis, uh, defined by the opinions of others. But we have the responsibility of changing the society so right. that these instances don't happen up, uh, uh, anymore. So you would give her that message that, you know, just because someone may perceive you that way, it doesn't define you. Would you like if that person were to come, you know, and knock on your door or make an appointment with you? I'm all we, virtual. This is COVID. No one's I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I, I, to, to be honest with you, we had the technology to, to do this 10 years ago. Um, For sure. So with that person. Would you have like, um, you know, an intake or, and then begin transactional analysis or how, how would you begin that just 
you know, a brief. Oh, you're trying to talk about how I work with people. Well, you're yeah. In this hypothetical way. I was trying to, okay, what? The, the, yeah. the, my question wasn't very well worded at all. Yeah, yeah, but so the thing is, what I typically will do is that um, before I meet with someone, I speak to them over the phone to find out if we're a good match, and also for them to ask questions, uh, just like as you did, about what is this EMDR thing and all that. Right. Just for them to be able to ask, uh, uh, ask the questions they need for them to make a good decision about whether they'd like to meet with me or not and to leave it up to them. And so the approach is uh, intentionally empowering, is that they are the ones who make their, their decision. I will only work with someone who wants to work with me. And it can't come from some outside influence because the purpose is all about empowerment. After that, there's questionnaires that they got to fill out just to make sure I know who I'm talking to. And also for them to, uh, for us to be able to have a baseline, because then after we had, ask questionnaires later on for us to see, have we actually had changes throughout our psychotherapy? These are just measurements. I'm a scientist, so I gotta, I gotta do that right. pre and post stuff. And that after that, then what we do is we gotta, um, what's it called? We use EMDR in a way that we teach them resources to recognize the awesomeness that they already come prepackaged with even before I start to teach them anything else. The, 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 when I, the reason why I talk about poverty is because poverty is the absence of resources. So uh, initially and at the beginning, we want to be able to uh, help the person to know that they already do have a wealth of like creativity, of beauty, of strength, of courage. All of this is outlined in the book as well. But it's, it's just to know that um, initially we want to prepare them and we want to strengthen them. We want to teach them tools that make it so that they don't even need a therapist. And if their problem still uh, uh, continues, then after we go on to EMDR. And EMDR therapy is then when we target the initial traumas that may have led them, uh, that might have sensitized themselves to these comments, and then empower them mm -hmm. to speak up for themselves and set the necessary boundaries so we reduce the frequency of this of these uh, microaggressions. Let me ask you. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with the, uh, I, the. I am looking at the time, though. Is that we may need to, we may need to wrap up in a bit. Okay. I think you said it was for an hour. Yeah. I let me see. I only have two or three more questions. So I'll try okay, to yeah, yeah. to bum rush them. So, if you're familiar with the. I've seen the Jane Elliott brown eye, blue eye yes. workshop. To what extent do you think these could actually be effective in being like a pipe bomb, you know, to institutionalized racism? Well, um, we need more Jane Elliott's. That's one. Yeah, she said she's not doing them anymore. Yeah, and you see the problem is in our society, yeah, so we place a lot of, uh, and this is no disrespect to her. I I think she's an awesome person. But yeah, generally speaking, we place a lot of emphasis on statues, and that's why it was a big, a big upset when people were really mad when people were taking down statues uh, last year. It's because the thing is, we uh, we kind of expect certain things to last forever, and the what we need to do is we need to start to think that when we do take down these statues or when these beloved people. When they do leave, then uh, what can we? What do we put in their place? And so I do think that there needs to be more Jane Elliotts. I do think also that there needs to be uh, more white people that are willing to have that level of creativity. And what's interesting is that you only know her name because her exercise left a mark on you. So very much so. Things, yeah, yeah, there's things that we can learn on the intellectual level, but the experiential level. Uh, in the body, in our hearts, in our, like, this is really what leaves these imprints in our mind for better or for worse. Because that's the way how you encode trauma, but it's also the way how you encode resilience and knowledge as well. Let me just ask you my final question. Sure. Where do you see racism and anti-racist psychotherapy 
uh, in general over time, do you see the practice of anti-racist psychotherapy evolving? Do you see it possibly being, you know, adopted, uh, you know, in, in other st in other provinces, mm -hmm. uh, in Canada or in other countries, any professional organizations that are uh, promulgating its use? Hmm. Well, that's a good, that's a good question. I think that uh, where the what I would like to see um, is that the next David Archer has it easier than I do. And that's, that's pretty much it. I'm not trying to look for some like international recognition or renown. Uh, I'm not a big fan. I'm an introvert. I'm not a big fan of all that stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm more of, of like thinking, how will people be able to use this book for more good? How will someone be able to use this book and make something better? How will our organizations be able to look at the chapter where I do talk about self-care and organizational care? And how will they be able to make their environments more anti-racist? And if not more anti-racist, then more compassionate. I'd like to see not only the anti-racist psychotherapy, but I'd like to see the anti-racist psychotherapy from the Middle Eastern perspective, from the Asian perspective, from, you know, from the, uh, from the indigenous perspective. I like to see white people say that, look, uh, this is our problem and we can fix it and then proceed to fix it. I think that that's the greatest that the, that would be better than any statue for me is that if there's a person who can wake up and be like, not only is it that this information intellectually has been stimulating for me, but that, uh, that they recognize their calling to make the world a better place, uh, through maybe glancing at the book, maybe reading a few pages, but also getting in touch with their with their inner resources so that they are committed to making a further change in the world. That's that's uh, the the best. That's the most that I can ask for. And if I got any of that stuff, I'd be uh, that'd be uh, it'd, it'd mean a lot to me. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Well, uh, David, I really appreciate your time and, and your input. Um, for people who would like to get on your wait list and uh, perhaps, you know, get a, a physical copy of your book, um, how can they reach out? Okay. So the thing is, you got to be a resident of Quebec because I'm a psychotherapist and we got boundaries of who we can serve. So I okay. can't be, can't I be talking to everyone. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, there's rules and laws and you guys got your state laws and stuff. That's like true. That. That's true. <laughs> Anyways. Um, uh, but, uh, if you want to get onto the, to, um, the mailing list, you can go to antiracistpsychotherapy.com and on that website, you're going to find, uh, not only my book, you're going to find that there's a hardcover version available, a paperback, and I recently released an audiobook version. So for those of you who are like, what, I can't, can't be reading all these pages. I got stuff to do. That's perfectly fine. So I was thinking of all you guys out there. So. What you can also do is that you can just l listen to it while you're, you know, doing the dishes, while I'm going for a walk. You can listen to me talking to you about memory reconsolidation and anti-racist psychotherapy. And uh, again, is that uh, the website is anti-racist psychotherapy, and yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of it. On Instagram, it's at anti-racist psychotherapy, and yeah, it's pretty much it. Well, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, please stick around with me for another minute or two. And for anyone uh, watching this or listening as an audio podcast, thank you so much for your time. Um, if you would like to submit a question for one of our listener question episodes, please go to askdms.blue. If you'd like to learn more about being a guest, or even having me on your podcast, just go to dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again, and take care, everybody. Many. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. 
If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.